Hey, today I'm shooting a cannon. No, not this cannon, this cannon here, the R6 Mark II. I'm actually shooting on the R5 right now, but we will switch soon to the R6 Mark II. And I want to compare the R6 Mark II to the XH2S from Fuji and Roma. Also has the Sony a7 IV here, so we will also compare it with that. I would say wherever I can, I will also compare it with the R5, so that you get an overview which camera you should buy. Let's go! Finally a nice morning again. I spent way too much time at home over the past few weeks. It's also sick a little bit. It's throat, you know. <coughs> Not COVID though. I already had COVID three months ago. Oh yeah, well, it's good to be outside again. It instantly makes you feel better. I never come here so early, but it's worth it for the sun and the clouds. Beautiful. Yeah, that's why I love this place here. Somebody clap. <laughs> So we did all the tests, Roma have to leave already, here's a nice camera channel as well with lots of GoPro content and so on, so check him out as well, I will leave a link to his channel in the description below and I would say let's come to the test results. The first test was the dynamic range and it's pretty much what I expected actually, I would overall say that Fujifilm and Sony win here, Canon clearly has a little bit darker shadows so there is less dynamic range in there, however I must also say that it was not a perfect situation all cameras still have all the shadow details available and I must say that I never really have situations where I need more dynamic range than that so for me it's perfectly fine but if we are technically accurate here it's very clear that Sony and Fujifilm are better than both Canon cameras here I must also say the Canon R6 Mark II and R5 seem to have a really similar dynamic range now the R5 appears to have a little bit more detail here but that's because it's a 50 millimeter lens it's a little bit more zoomed in so of course we are closer to the tree here and therefore I can also see more detail there but overall it's not that anything in the darker areas of the image is clipped here on the Canon camera so in that situation I'm really happy with it when it comes to the comparison between the XH2S and the Sony though it actually looks really really similar here by the dynamic range and that pretty much confirms again what I've already figured out in my initial XH2S review about five months ago because there also saw the dynamic range is really really similar maybe slightly better on the Fuji because of that stacked sensor but not by a degree that it would really matter but what I also noticed there because I shot it in my room was that there was a bit of noise reduction going on in the Sony cameras both the a7S 3 and a7 IV because there on my curtains I could see that the small details were already gone while they were still present in the Fujifilm but the Fujifilm also has a bit more noise in the shadows and that's also the case here in that shot I can see more noise in the shadows of the Fujifilm than in all other cameras but it's not bad Fujifilm film noise doesn't look bad and after color grading you don't really see that anymore so it's perfectly fine so to sum it up yes the Canon R6 Mark II and R5 have a bit less dynamic range than the other two cameras but in my opinion it's not that big of a difference that you can't get good looking shots with it anymore it's all that I really need so non-issue for me maybe it's an issue from you you have to decide actually there is a construction going on which gets increasingly loud so I would say let's better go home now and continue Continue the video there. Okay, that took a bit longer than expected. I already finished the overheating and low light test, so I would say let's straight talk about all those results. And at first there's also the rolling shutter performance of the R6 Mark II. It's actually a R5 here. I'm recording on the R6 Mark II right now. And I must say the rolling shutter performance is very similar to the R5. And actually on the R5 I tested it both in 4K HQ and also in 4K line skipped. And to me it looked like very similar and also very similar in both cases 
reference to the R6 Mark II. Maybe if you really do more scientific tests, let's say you would somehow ensure that it rotates at exactly the same speed, maybe then you would notice slight differences. But from my unscientific tests with my hands, I could not tell any differences there. However, both the R5 and R6 Mark II performed better in rolling shutter performance as the A7 IV does. It's probably because of the 33 megapixels, it's just a little bit too much to read that sensor. But the clear winner in terms of rolling shutter performance is definitely the Fujifilm X-H2S. I mean, the rolling shutter performance in F-Log or when you film F-Log 2 in 4K60 or 4K120 is actually better as on the Sony A7S III, only slightly better, 20 milliseconds and so on. And I can see that. Like, I tested it once with F-Log 2 where the rolling shutter performance is a little bit lower, but even there it was barely noticeable. And then when I switched to F-Log 1, there was no issue with rolling shutter at all anymore. So here the Fujifilm with its stacked sensor and APS-C design clearly has the advantage. It's actually one reason why this camera is also so good when it comes to video quality, rolling shutter performance. Then I also tested IBIS performance. I did two tests there at first vlogging and then also B-roll shooting. And I must say the IBIS tests were not perfectly fair because on the Fujifilm I only have the Tamron 17-70 to right now. I sold the Viltrox already so I couldn't test it on an ultra wide angle lens so that definitely has an advantage. And on the Sony a7 IV I also could only test it at 20 millimeters because that's the widest lens that Roma has so also a slight disadvantage here but I think we already know from experience and from other reviews that Sony and Fujifilm don't really have issues with wobbling for example when it comes to the ultra wide angle focal lengths but where they struggle a bit more is that the IBIS generally is a bit more jittery and on the Fuji also a bit jumpy sometimes and these experiences and other reviews also confirm my experiences here I would say the R6 Mark II had the worst wobble issues at 15 millimeters. The R5 was actually slightly better. I hope that they bring the same firmware fix to the R6 Mark II soon so that the wobble also gets better there. I mean, they mentioned during the launch that the R6 Mark II should perform better when it comes to IBIS, but for now, at least when it comes to wobbling, it's not much better. But what I also noticed later while I was standing was that even when I was just standing and only used inbuilt stabilization and optical stabilization from the lens, I already got wobble, but the moment I turned EIS on, just a standard electronic image stabilization, then it already looked really good. Or when I also zoomed into 20 millimeters, then the wobble was also pretty much gone. Slightly little bits there in the corners, but nothing major. So if you really want to get rid of that wobble, just turn the EIS on, in my opinion, and then it looks perfectly fine and usable. And I must also say, when it comes to vlogging for me, when I vlog, it's only for a few seconds usually, like usually 10 to 30 seconds, and it mustn't look perfectly fine. And it's, it's not a movie vlogging. It can look a bit rougher. So even if I get a bit of wobble sometimes, it's not a big issue for me me and when I talk for longer periods of time I always put my camera on a tripod anyway and there I don't get any wobbles so for me it's not really a big issue but yeah I would also love if Canon fixed that and I mean I used the a7 IV for a pretty long time and also the X-H2S now for about four to five months and there I never really got any major wobble issues even with wider lenses so there I can say you're safe from that but therefore you have other issues on those like the Sony is generally a little bit rougher but therefore you get other issues with the IBIS there Sony is generally a bit rougher which is not necessarily a problem when you're vlogging because again like vlogs can be a bit rougher it's okay and on the Fujifilm especially you sometimes have this jerkiness that the, the IBIS feels like it's jumping a little bit which is also not actually a big issue because you can can easily fix it in post by applying additional stabilization which doesn't even crop that much and it instantly solves that. That's also why I never really had an issue with that on the Fujifilm in my reviews before. And I also tested it for B-roll and there I definitely have to give it to the Canon there. I shot on all systems at 35 millimeter full frame or I put the 24 millimeter on the X-H2S, so 36 millimeter there, and I just did a handheld slide. I must say there I clearly have to give it to the Canons, like that's already Panasonic level. It was so smooth. I love that for B-roll shots and I already noticed that before, like on the Canon you can really like do really, really subtle movements and it looks perfectly smooth, while on both Sony and Fujifilm you would get either a bit of jumping in there or you would see a little bit of micro jitters in the footage. So when it comes to IBIS for handheld B-roll shooting, then I can only say that both Canon's the R5 and R6 Mark II win here, they actually perform really similar in that case. And that also makes it really 
really hard to mention a clear winner here for Ibis. I mean, if you want to walk around a lot while vlogging, then maybe the cannons are not the very best. I mean, you can turn EIS on and it will be fine. Also, the R5 is overall not that bad anymore, but maybe in that case you would rather go for a Sony especially, like the overall performance then is a bit better. However, if you shoot a lot of smooth B-roll and you only do occasional quick vlogs or you put the camera on a tripod anyway like I do, then I think you should seriously consider the Canon cameras. We also tested autofocus outside and when it comes to autofocus testing, what I realized, especially by using the Fujifilm X-H2S now over four to five months is that it's just not enough to do the usual test to like put it on a tripod and just see what it does. We did that with all four cameras and I must say like overall it's very similar. Like they all tracked me well when I was farther away and walked close to the camera or the opposite. Like in that case, you will be happy with all of those cameras. However, there are a few differences. The Fujifilm, I would say, uh, felt a bit more jumpy when it uh, came to autofocusing there, while the Canons and Sony's performed a bit smoother, so that you have a smoother transition in the autofocus, while in the Fujifilm, you sometimes, if, if you look at the trees, it looks a bit like a flicker effect then, because the autofocus is a bit more jumpy. And now, this is not an issue with the Tamron lens right now, or with any other lenses on the Fujifilm system. When I use Tamron lenses on Sony cameras, when I use Viltrox lenses on Sony cameras, Sigma or whatever I want, I don't get this jumpiness. This is a problem with the Fujifilm system. You can't blame that on the lens. So in my opinion here, when it comes to the autofocusing test, then Fujifilm is still a little bit behind. Also because the autofocus is not as capable as on Sony or Canon. For example, you don't have touch tracking available on both Sony and Canon. I can touch on the screen and it tracks wherever I press. I must say, that functionality works a bit better on Sony. When I did touch tracking on the R6 Mark II and the R5, then it, it seemed like it lost the subject a little bit faster or it, it um, looked at it somewhere else, while on the Sony's that's pretty much locked on all the time. And on Fujifilm, you don't have that feature at all. So I think also feature-wise, like Fujifilm lags a bit behind there. You also noticed on the R6 Mark II that when I turned around the first time, I got a little bit of hunting there. But there, I think that was my fault because I was not in focus when I started turning around and when I turned around the second time then it tracked me perfectly fine so I think if I have waited maybe half a second longer or so until I was in focus I expect that I wouldn't get this issue. So overall when it comes to autofocusing I would clearly say Sony is overall the winner here they still have the best autofocusing system mainly because it's a little bit stickier and when you adjust the speed a bit then it's also pretty smooth. Second tier is Canon both the R5 and R6 Mark II perform really similar in my opinion and it's also pretty good. It is sticky but from my testing it's not as good exactly as Sony. It's maybe 5% behind or so and then when it comes to the Fujifilm from my long-term experience here over four to five months of usage it's just still a bit behind there, both in terms of functionality, but also stickiness. But what I must also say is that the differences here are really not big. Like in 95% of the cases where you film, you will get really good performance with the Fujifilm. But I've just noticed here in my studio, for example, maybe because of the gray walls or so, the Fujifilm just hunts all the time. Doesn't matter what settings I use. I tried it with different lenses. I tried it in Eterna and F-Lock and F-Lock 2. It's all the time the same. So here in my studio, at least, I don't get reliable performance with the Fujifilm. However, every time when I was shooting outside, the Fujifilm performed really good. So it's like you will most likely be fine when it comes to autofocusing with any of those cameras, but I would clearly say that with Fujifilm you might have a few more issues here and there and also a bit more jumpiness. And another test that we did outside was a quick color test and that is actually really difficult to judge I would say colors because it always depends like do you do you measure it by how you like the color straight out of camera, do you measure it by accuracy or do you measure it by how easy it is to color grade the footage. So with the test outside I wanted to see how accurate the colors are so what I did was that I dragged all the footage in DaVinci Resolve. I used color space transforms for the R6 Mark II, R5 and the Fujifilm A7 IV and Cinematch for the Fujifilm X-H2S because the X-H2S F-Log2 color profile is not available for color space transforms yet in DaVinci Resolve. I have to wait for that. 
And however, I w just wanted to see there how color accurate they were. So what I did to really be sure that they are on the same level, I used the automatic white balance function from DaVinci Resolve, clicked on the gray part from the color checker there, and then I looked on the vector scope how the colors match up. I would say that the Canon R5 and R6, the colors they are very, very similar, and they overall have the most balanced image. Now, this is a bit difficult because overall the U ranges, they are a bit more accurate accurate on the Sony. On the Sony a7 IV, the U values all point in the right directions, especially when it comes to the red. There the Canon is lacking a little bit, like the red seems to be a bit more on the magenta side there, but all the other, other colors are also very, very accurate on the Canon cameras. By the way, I recorded in C-Log3 on both Canons and S-Log3 on the Sony and F-Log2 on the Fujifilm, so it's like all the, the high dynamic range color profiles here that I tested. But what I must say on the Sony cameras is that when it comes to saturation, it puts a strong emphasis on the warm colors while it reduces all the greens and the blue especially a little bit. And that's why I think that overall many people like the colors from the Canons a bit more because they are very well distributed across the whole color range. That's why it's actually difficult to say which camera is more accurate because overall when I stretch the, the saturation so that all the use fall into place in, in the vector scope and I clearly have to give it to Canon but the U range at least from the reds is a little bit more accurate on the Sony so it's like how do you judge it now right but then when we're also talking about the Fujifilm I would say the Fujifilm when it comes to accuracy performs the worst and I think it's not really an issue because if you shoot a Fujifilm camera you're going for that film look film like colors and you're not really going for the most color accuracy so in my opinion every camera pretty much gives you exactly what you expect from it I think people go for Canon because they want this overall rich image, which also looks pretty accurate. I would generally say that Sony shooters worry a bit about other specs than colors, but I mean, we see here also that the U-ranges are really good. So if you want to get the same rich colors as Canon, for example, you can use your U versus saturation curves in post to raise the blues and the greens, etc. And when it comes to skin tones, you can also make some adjustments. It's a bit more difficult than on Canon and Fuji. I like skin tones on these cameras a bit more, but you can also totally make it work, especially if you work with tools such as Cinemage, Film Convert, etc. It makes it generally a bit easier because that tools basically do all that stuff for you. And when it comes to Fujifilm, I think Fuji users don't really worry about accurate colors. You want film-like colors and this camera totally gives you that, so I wouldn't, wouldn't worry about it. What surprised me was actually both Canon cameras, R5 and R6, because they were the most easy to color grade. It's like like I have different processes for color grading log footage and there's at first like color space transform in DaVinci Resolve, there's a color managed workflow in DaVinci Resolve, then there is the LUTs from the, from the manufacturer's website always, that's a standard workflow, then Cinemage and Film Convert. And I can only say that on most cameras that I've ever used there were always some processes that worked really good while others not so much and on the Canon cameras no matter what I threw at it, it always looked pretty good. I must say Film Convert was definitely a bit better on the Fujifilm and on all other workflows, I got really usable results straight after applying that lock conversion there. So that's actually a big one for Canon, but when it comes to Sony, I would generally say just use the Phantom LUTs there. They generally gave me really good results and made color grading these cameras also really easy. So it's like, yeah, you can color grade all of those cameras really easily, but but on some cameras like Sony, Fuji, you need the right workflow for it and always use the same. While on Canon, it feels like you can throw at it whatever you want and you always get good results. And this is actually something that I really love. And let's talk about overheating. I tested all of those cameras here next to each other on my desk, having the screen unfolded. And I set my air conditioning unit to 24 degrees Celsius. Now I must say the sun was shining directly on my room here. So it was definitely hotter than 24 degrees. It was like I was sitting next to the cameras for a few minutes at first. I wasn't really sweating, but I had like slightly wet skin. So I expect it to be maybe 28 degrees or something like that. Definitely a bit hot, hotter as you would usually record an interview in. 
And the results were actually a bit surprising for me because when I tested the A7 IV before, it was actually not that good when it comes to overheating. Like in my room without air conditioning, it already overheated in 30 minutes. But when I did the side-by-side -side comparison now, the Sony a7 IV actually got over two hours, two hours, five minutes without any issues at all. The Fujifilm also two hours, six minutes. And the R6 Mark II overheated after one hour, 36 minutes, I guess. Yeah, one hour, 36 minutes. What I must say though on the R6 Mark II, I turned it like after it turned off. I, I was not here actually. I was bringing our cat to the hospital. I came back around five minutes after the camera overheated. I turned it straight back on and it recorded for another 20 minutes until the battery was empty. So I find that even if it seems like that the R6 Mark II overheats a little bit quicker as the A7 IV, at least in this condition, that it's not a big issue overall because you can pretty much directly press record again after a few minutes and it's fine. So if I would record an interview, it would usually not be one and a half hours anyway without any breaks. There's usually half an hour to one hour until we make a little break of like five to 10 minutes and then we start again. So I think that under real shooting conditions, you won't get any issues with the R6 Mark II too. But I must also clearly say that the other cameras, the Fujifilm and the Sony's performed better. I mean, Fujifilm is tricking it a little bit. It's an APS-C sensor and also stacked. So Fujifilm probably has the advantage here. When it comes to the R5, I must say I messed up the test there because I did not think about the 30 minutes recording limit. So at first I was doing some stuff here on my computer and I didn't notice that the camera shut off. So I overall got one hour, 25 minutes out of the R5 while the other cameras were recording for two hours and six. I never got any overheating warning there. So it seems like also not bad, but with all the breaks in between, you definitely can't compare it to the other cameras. So take it with a grain of salt here with the R5. But I mean, I've seen in other reviews that people recorded 8K raw internally for over two hours while being at, I think 21 degrees Celsius. So to me, it looks like Canon and fix the overheating issues on the R5 as well. But yeah, overall conclusion, I would give it to the Sony and Fujifilm here. I would say that if we would push it even harder, I think that the Fujifilm would perform better because it has an APS-C sensor, which generates less heat. And honestly, I never even got a warning with the X-H2S. While on the Sony a7 IV, I actually had a live stream once where the camera started overheating. I think it was about 30 minutes or so, and it was only just 1080p. So with the a7 IV, I, I'm never really sure what I get with it, but on the Fujifilm, I was always really safe. I also did a quick low light test here in my studio and straight out of camera, it was pretty much what I expected, but after color grading the footage, it was a bit different. So straight out of camera, the Fujifilm definitely performed the worst and that's what I expected. Expected. It's an APS-C sensor, so at 12,800 you just see a lot of noise there. Then second worst performer was the A7 IV. And that actually surprised me a little bit, but yeah, could be, I mean, lots of megapixels there, so you get a bit more noise, but also more oversampling, so wasn't really sure about that. Then third one was the R6 Mark II, bit less noise, but uh, it's a surprise that we will come soon to. And then the R5 performed the best, which is probably because it oversampled from 8K, which reduces a lot of the noise. However, after color grading the footage, the results were pretty different. There, the R6 Mark II performed the worst, like you can see in the transition from the midtones to the shadows on the table that there is a lot of noise in there. I'm not really sure if you can still see that after the YouTube compression kicks in. I can see that in my screen, there's especially a lot of color noise in there, which doesn't look nice at all. Then second was the footage Fujifilm X-H2S. Fujifilm X-H2S, the noise looks a little bit better because there is not much color noise there. It's more chroma noise and it's generally a bit more pleasing, but it is in the same area. And A7 IV performed a little bit better than the X-H2S. There I can definitely see less noise. I think it's actually already so low that you won't be able to see any of that anymore after the YouTube compression kicks in. So that's already pretty good performance there. And then the R5, as expected already from what I've seen before, there hasn't been any noise in there anymore. So technically it is true that the R6 Mark II is the worst performer here. However, if I only apply a little bit of noise reduction in DaVinci Resolve, in my case it was 9%, then the noise on all cameras is completely gone. I can't see anything anymore and looks perfectly clean for me, which is why, again, like I think even at 12,800 ISO with all of those cameras, you can get usable results at least after applying noise reduction in post. Definitely give it 
into the R5 here because of that oversampling, it reduces the most noise. Also the Sony a7 IV looks pretty good after color grading, so if you see a bit of noise straight out of camera, don't worry too much, it's totally fine. And by the way, always also shoot log profiles when you shoot in low light. Don't go for standard picture profiles because standard picture profiles don't just give you more noise, they give you less dynamic range. So essentially you throw more dynamic range away as necessary to reduce the noise. So essentially you get less detail in your shots and you can easily reduce the noise always in post either with noise reduction or by simply darkening your shadows so that the noise gets hidden in the shadows but you still have more dynamic range available if you shoot in lock so that makes your overall image look a bit better. And by the way how I did this low light test was that I always exposed to the right so it was not like that my metering showed zero and that my histogram was somewhere in the middle or to the left. I always tried to expose one third of a stop before clipping because the darker your scene gets with any camera the more you want to overexpose because otherwise you get more and more noise in the shadows. And that's probably also the reason why all cameras here at least after noise reduction give me really good results. If I would have exposed darker there would definitely be more noise in all of those cameras and the images would look worse. So if you record in low light especially when you record lock also try to overexpose your image as much as possible without clipping the highlights at least unless you have direct light sources in your shot and then you get the best results there. So that were all the tests but when choosing between all of those cameras it's also important to be aware of the lens options that you have and the budget that you have for lenses. And I would overall say that Sony wins here because Sony offers you the widest variety of lenses, especially if you want lenses that you don't need an adapter for. And you also find really good lenses in all price classes. Like they have the G Master lenses, which are pretty expensive, but also the best. But then they also have all the third party lenses, Sigma, Tamron, Vilchox, etc., which all have pretty good lenses available for affordable prices. And that's why I think that when it comes to lens options, most people will actually take tend to go for Sony. However, when it comes to Canon and Fujifilm, Canon has the disadvantage that right now at least they don't allow third-party manufacturers to produce lenses for their mount and that means that you have to buy native Canon lenses which adds a lot of money. What you can do though when you shoot Canon is to get the EF adapter What also gives an advantage because some of the EF adapters have a variable ND filter included so you don't need an ND filter in front of your lens anymore. You can just quickly adjust it at the back of the lens that's really convenient but I personally don't like to use adapters with lenses simply because it makes the overall setup longer and also a bit more front heavy especially if you use heavier lenses and that's why I prefer to stick to native RF lenses and they get pretty expensive like the 15 to 35 millimeter I don't even know the US prices I bought at gray market here in Thailand because it's so expensive but I think it's somewhere close to 3000 US dollars or so and that is a hefty price. Must say Canon already offers a few cheaper lenses but they are not as nice as what you can get with third-party manufacturers on Sony because they're usually f4 for example the 50 or 14 to 35 millimeters an f4 lens so it gives you a bit less background blur or if you get even cheaper the 15 to 30 millimeter it's an f4 until 7.1 lens even less background blur so it's just overall not as nice lenses so that is something to consider if you invest in Canon you definitely need a bit more money to buy the lenses but therefore I must also say that the lenses that you get for Canon RF are really really good it's actually the big reason why I'm switching now back to Canon because when I had the EOS R about three years ago and the 15 to 35 millimeter lens I just loved the lens so much and yeah, that's that's why I was actually interested in Canon again after I saw that they finally brought out a quite usable body with the R6 Mark II. And then there's also Fujifilm and I think when it comes to Fujifilm they have all the lenses you need. A lot of those lenses are cheap and they are generally good lenses but when it comes to video shooting these lenses are not really optimized for video, at least many of them. For example, when it comes to zoom lenses on Fujifilm, when you zoom in, you always get this exposure stepping. I experienced that with all lenses, even the Tamron here. So I think it's also a problem of the Fujifilm system or not, not necessarily of the lens itself, even if some people claim otherwise. But I know that with the Tamron lenses, you don't get exposure stepping on Sony, for example, but you get it on the Fuji. So it is a Fujifilm problem. And when it comes to prime lenses on the Fujifilm system, at least from the native prime lenses from Fuji, there are many that don't have fast motors. They still use the old motors and they are also not that good for videos. So when you want to buy lenses for Fujifilm, you always want to ensure that there are the letters LM in the lens naming in there because that means linear motors and that are the new ones. They are a bit faster. So 
they are better for video. But even there, they are not always like perfectly good. For example, 16 to 55 millimeter from Fuji has still sometimes a bit of pulsing in the background. So it's also not like a super nice video lens. So Fujifilm also has the new PZ lenses that should be optimized for video. But again, you get exposure stepping there. It's only F4. So I don't really consider these lenses for myself. And when it comes to Fujifilm, there's also the problem with super wide angle zoom lenses. You get the 10 to 24 millimeter F4 lens. And to be honest, I don't really want to shoot f4 wide angle lenses on APS-C because I want to have a bit of background blur there. Then you get the 8 to 16 millimeter f2.8 which is a really nice lens overall but you can't really attach ND filters at the front. I mean there are some ND filters but they are really rare to find and that can also be an issue especially if you shoot at f log 2 with ISO 1250. It's just too bright then. And then like the probably the best wide angle lens that you can get for the Fujifilm system right now is the Viltrox 13 millimeter 1.4 but that's not a zoom lens. So it's like when it comes to ultra wide angle lenses, you are really limited with a Fujifilm system. So be aware of that as well. Now it might sound pretty negative, but I shot the Fujifilm now for four to five months and I got really good results with it. I mostly shot with a 16 to 55 from Fuji and also the Viltrox 30 millimeter 1.4. It is totally doable to shoot really nice looking videos with this camera, especially because it's overall the most capable of all of them. We're talking about specs soon. But yeah, when it comes to lens options, I just have to give it to Sony or Canon. You have more options on both systems there. Yeah, they might be a bit more expensive, especially on Canon, but therefore you just have the better lenses available there. So let's also quickly talk about specs. I will not mention all specs of all cameras here. You can research that by yourself on their websites, but I want to mention the standout specs of each cameras here. I would say this is where the Fujifilm X-H2S is the clear winner because it has 4K 120 frames per second. You can record in ProRes. You can record 6.2K open gate. It has DCI 4K and you even have a CFast Express Type B card. And additionally, it features a stacked sensor which gives you all these incredible rolling shutter performance and great dynamic range etc. And that's why I would say when it comes to specs the Fujifilm puts all other cameras in that price range and even above in the shadow. I mean you also get 26 megapixels with this camera which is great for time lapses and photography. For example the most similar camera is probably the a7S III where you also get 4k 120 frames per second and great rolling shutter etc. But it only has 12 megapixels. So the Fujifilm overall is the best hybrid camera that you can buy right now when it comes to specs but unfortunately it still lags a little bit behind when it comes to autofocus and I really emphasize little bit here because the autofocusing system overall is pretty good just in certain conditions and yeah lens choices could be a little bit better especially on the wide angle side. When it comes to the Sony a7 IV I would say that the most standout feature there is the 33 megapixels great for time lapses and photography but it also gives you larger file sizes which might be an issue and what I like about the Sony a7 IV and Sony cameras in general is the zebra options because in Sony you can really limit the zebra that it shows you zebra from a start to a specific value and you can adjust that stepless in between while on the Canon for example you can also define a range but you can also do that in five or five percent increments. This is a bit limiting sometimes and the Fujifilm is the worst there when it comes to zebra settings. There you can only define a zebra value and everything above that zebra value is zebra and I find it quite distracting because what you can use zebras for, for example, is to set skin tones, whether to expose skin tones right. And that works really, really good on the Sony cameras. And where the Sony a7 IV lags a little bit behind in terms of specs is that it has a crop of 1.5x when you want to shoot in 4K 60. Both the Fujifilm and the R6 Mark II don't have that. I'd never found that a big issue when I was shooting with the a7 IV, to be honest, because usually when you want to shoot slow motion, you want to get a bit closer to the subject anyway to emphasize that. So I never find, found it a limiting factor but I would definitely prefer it as it is on the Fuji or the R6 Mark II because then it doesn't change at all and I have more flexibility. And as mentioned the Sony a7 IV also has breathing compensation. It also has this focus map feature but I, I don't, I'd never really used it. I found it distracting so I don't really count that as a big plus here. You don't really need it. When it comes to the Canon R6 Mark II I would say the most standout feature is definitely that it's the only full frame 4K 60 full width camera. So there's no crop applied there. I think a 1.07 crop, but you have that 
also in 24 and 30 frames per second there, which is not, not an issue at all. Then it has false color, what is good for videographers to expose for skin tones and other parts of your image. And it is also the only camera, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, that has subject only detection autofocus. It basically means that it only tracks faces, but as soon as there is not a face or another subject that you selected in the shot anymore, it won't focus on the background. The focus just stays where it is. There's no hunting, nothing. And that is a dream. I think this feature is what would actually make the autofocusing system of the Fujifilm pretty much perfect because then you can be sure that there's no hunting anymore. So Fujifilm, that would be an idea for a future film firmware upgrade. And another standout feature of the R6 Mark II is also that you can shoot in full HD in 1080p. To be honest, I did not even try this feature because I saw in other reviews that it doesn't look as good and I'm quite of a perfectionist. I would rather shoot in 4K 60fps and then use certain tools like optical flow in DaVinci Resolve or Final Cut or even Topaz AI, Topaz Video AI to make it even slower or I would shoot simply in 1080p 120 because I don't really need that crazy slow motion but yeah it's definitely a nice feature to have if you want to get this super slow motion. When it comes to the Canon R5 I mean clearly the most standout features there are the 45 megapixels 8k recording 8k raw the super good looking 4k because it's oversampled from 8k that's to me the most standout feature on this camera and it also has 4K 120, but the R5 is also over $1,000 more than the other cameras here. They are all $2,500 while the Canon R5 is $3,800 here. I just included the Canon R5 to be honest because I just had it available, so why not? So clearly when it comes to specs, then the Fujifilm wins hands down here. So I would say if you don't need the very best autofocus and you're okay with those lens choices, you don't really zoom in while you're shooting especially, then the Canon is actually the best choice that you can make here. However, specs are not everything. As we could also see from the test, there are good reasons why you want to get other cameras, especially Sony, but maybe also Canon. And a kind of spec is also the button customizations and the bodies overall. And when it comes to button customizations, I must clearly say that Sony is the winner here again. After that comes Fuji and then Canon because on Sony I can really customize the hell out of it. I can assign pretty much every function to every button. I can even tell the a7 IV which settings should stay the same when I switch between different custom modes. That is super useful and a lot of this stuff is not possible on the Fujifilm and the Canon camera. I mean the Fujifilm also lets you customize the hell out of it but when it comes to custom modes for example I cannot choose which custom mode stays the same. It kind of sucks because that essentially means that you have to reset the white balance for example all the time when you switch between custom modes. I don't like that and the reason why I would also prefer the Sony and the Fujifilm X-H2S over the Canon cameras when it comes to button customization is actually that I can just customize more. For example crop mode. I like on Sony and Fuji cameras that I can just assign a button, that's my front button here, to quickly switch into crop mode to the, in, in this camera so that I get a bit more reach from my lens. It's especially useful if you shoot with prime lenses or wide angle lenses but also sometimes. And I can't do that with Canon. On Canon I always have to go into the menu to switch to crop mode. Now I can assign a custom mode for the crop mode but I would just prefer to reserve the custom mode for something different and just press a button to be able to crop in quickly. Canon doesn't give me. And also on Sony and Fujifilm I can assign the record button to another function if I have the record button already on the shutter and I also can't do that on Canon cameras. Like I start recording on the shutter button and now the record button is basically useless for me. So why Canon? Why can't I adjust this button. It's it's like, I, I don't understand it. So I think when it comes to button customization and Canon still has a lot of potential to improve there and I think that can all be done via firmware upgrade. There's no reason not to have that. However, when we talk about buttons, I think next also comes the overall feeling of the body and this is something where Canon clearly wins to me. When I was out shooting with Roma and I gave him the R6 Mark II for a few minutes, I could hear him sa saying, man, this feels so solid. And this is exactly the feeling that I have with Canon cameras. The moment you hold them in your hands, feel this nice big grip here, the body feels really solid. I like the material that they use here at the top. It like feels a bit more premium than Fujifilm and Sony. Actually Fujifilm and Sony looks like they use pretty much the same materials there. 
And so overall, when it comes to just body handling and how the body feels in my hand, then clearly is a big difference between Canon and the other cameras there. I would say second is Fujifilm here for me because the grip here feels a little bit better in my hand, like the way how my fingers wrap around. I mean, body handling and feeling is definitely not the most important spec. It doesn't give you better footage, but when you're in the shop and you have the budget to even buy Canon with some lenses and you, you get all these bodies in your hands, then you will most likely be torn towards Canon just because it feels so nice. It's at least how it would be for me. And I already have small hands and I still like it. For bigger hands, that's even better. So let's wrap this up, which is actually not easy because all of those cameras are actually excellent cameras. Now in this review it looks a bit like, yeah, of course, one camera has the advantage over the other in certain aspects. But I must also say that all of these advantages and disadvantages are really, really minor. Like when we're talking about dynamic range, for example, yeah, Sony and Fujifilm are better, but they are not like day and night better. In most situations, you will be perfectly fine with a Canon. It comes to auto focusing on the Fujifilm, yeah, it's a little bit behind Sony and Canon, but it's not far behind. In most situations, it will work good, and the few times where it doesn't work good, you can still switch to the zone autofocus and just keep your subject in the zone all the time and it will not hunt or anything. On the Canon, yeah, maybe you have to pay a bit more money for lenses, but if you have that money, you will also be really happy with the system overall. So you see, like, when if m money is not an issue, you can pretty much walk into the camera shop, put all these cameras on a table, get them in your hands, look which one you like the most and just buy it. You don't really have to worry about anything of that anymore. So overall, I think that no matter which of those cameras you will choose, you will be happy with it. Most people I still think will be the happiest with Sony simply because of the lens choice and overall having a really good system. But I think there are also many people that would rather go with Canon or Fujifilm because there are also a few advantages. I will stick with Canon now because the few downside that it has, especially the Ibis wobble, are not really downsides for me. I can compensate for that. I really like the colors and the workflow with these cameras and 4K60 oversampled on the R6 Mark II is definitely nice. I also like to shoot a lot of time lapses and the 45 megapixels from the R5 is great for that. But that doesn't mean that you have to do the same. I know for sure that there are many people that will be happy with Sony or Fujifilm. It really comes down to what you want. And aside from that, if you're interested in the Fujifilm camera, that is what I was shooting all the past month with. Check out these two videos here in the corner. There you will see a bit more what you can do with it. And aside from that, don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button if you like this video and you want to see more about the Canon R6 Mark II and what I do with it in upcoming videos. See you there.